Alex McNulty. I'm an artist, educator, and the director of Ann Street Gallery since March. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the space, and Kyle on Zoom, welcome. Um, among the many things that bring us here today is a name to remember, interrogate, and honor the history of the land and its inhabitants, past and present. And so I wish to begin the gathering with an acknowledgement that remaining today on stolen land, on the ancestral lands of the Manse Lenape and Mexican tribes who possess sacred connections to it and have stewarded the land for thousands of years before the arrival of white settlers. It's one of my aims for this space that our programming as a whole might become a living, evolving acknowledgement and interrogation of histories of land as, and a testament to our commitment to stewarding recognizing and imagining relationships to place through art and culture. We're invested in understanding the relationship between place, land, and untold and under-recognized, under-recorded, and unheard histories, and in supporting artists and cultural producers who give voice and form to histories, modes of stewardship, and visions for relationships to land and place. Industry Gallery presents contemporary art exhibitions and programming that create new opportunities for education and immersion in the arts in Newburgh. Our mission is to provide innovative exhibitions, events, and programs that seek to increase arts literacy and appreciation by engaging community like yourselves and promoting forward thinking, socially and ecologically responsive, and underrepresented positions in contemporary practice. The History Gallery is a program of Safe Harbors of the Hudson, um, this larger block um, that you are situated on. Safe Harbors of the Hudson is a large-scale nonprofit redevelopment project here in Newburgh with the mission of transforming lives and building community through housing and the arts. Safe Harbors works for equitable access to housing and the arts and strives to present inclusive, relevant, and reflective programming in the city of Newburgh. Um, the gallery will be open today, tomorrow, 12 to 4, and then we'll close the next two weekends for the holidays. Uh, we'll open again um, every Saturday and Sunday in January and February, 12 to 4. We're planning programming on Saturday afternoons, so keep up with our Instagram, our website, and um, the project from the ground up's dedicated Instagram account um, at FTGU2024, right? Um, <laughs> And uh, all the updates will be placed there as we get those programming uh, slotted um, with different artists, events, conversations, and presentations. Um, Jean-Marc is also here um, manning the gallery on Saturdays and Sundays um, and just makes himself available so often for conversations that might occur outside those events as well. Um, let's see, so, okay, now for today's event. Um, just allow me to introduce and read the bio for Jean-Marc. Um, Jean-Marc is Superville Sovac is a multidisciplinary artist and teaching professional whose work represents silent histories of multiracial identities that make up the DNA of this country as well as his own. His ahistorical landscapes involve altering original 19th century landscape engravings to include images from anti-slavery publications. His public artwork includes organizing a bur burial for white supremacy, retracing steps on the underground Railroad at Hudson Valley Historic Sites, monuments to Afro-Dutch pioneers in Rockland County, and a memorial to the earliest Africans to arrive in Rhode Island. A graduate of Bard College MFA in Film and Video, John Mark is the 2023 recipient of the Arts Mid-Hudson Empowering Artist Award and an Individual Artist Commission. John Mark's art has been exhibited at Recess Art, Brooklyn, the Aldridge Contemporary Art Museum, Arts Westchester, Socrates Sculpture Park, and the Katona Museum of Art, among many other places. Jean-Marc has been a guest curator at the Dorsky Museum and has been visiting artists at Bard College, SUNY New Paltz, Columbia University, and Vassar College. Uh, we're super honored, to, just a privilege to work with Jean-Marc through this project and to host you all today. Um, two more brief credits. The project is made possible by an Orange County um, Arts Council grant and this event today is made possible by a vision grant from Humanities New York. Um, Humanities New York encourages critical thinking and cultural understanding in the public arena through grants, programs, networking, and advocacy. 
You can visit humanitiesnewyork.org to learn more. Thanks for tolerating all this, Kevin. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you, and you know, here's, here's the reason we're all here. I'm so eager to hear your presentation and your introduction to the project. Welcome. Thank you um, for coming out on such a gorgeous day. I'm sure there's lots of other reasons to be outside. Um, but um, I, I just want to, first of all, acknowledge that the reason this is, is, is happening uh, at all is, and, and if anyone has ever been involved in any type of artistic or public endeavor, you know how difficult it is to just have the, the, the confidence and um, to deal with the doubt. Um, the imposter syndrome is real, right? And the only antidote to that doubt that I have learned is of value, the only antidote is trust. And so I, I feel very privileged to have had earned the trust of uh, Allison and also of uh, Lisa, Lisa Silverstone, executive director. And um, we have two members of the, what was once known as the Newburgh Colored Burial Ground, the committee uh, here today, uh, Gabrielle uh, Hill, and Ray, uh, what's your last name? Harvey. Harvey, thank you. <laughs> Ray Harvey. Um, and, and so that trust is, 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 what, is what keeps this going for me. Um, so before um, I start uh, this presentation about just giving an idea of what this racially ambiguous looking person might have got themselves involved with a colored burial ground in Newburgh. How did this and, and any of this uh, is, is possible? Um, I'd just like to spend um, a moment, even though we've had several moments here of laughter and of joy and of, of, of celebration in a way, I'd like to uh, spend a minute, actually um, a minute and, and 58 seconds to be exact. It's one second for each of the individuals that are represented here. The 108 to my count plus, there are certainly um, more to be, to be accounted for. So I'd like to just take uh, that time. If you would like to hold that moment to think about someone maybe who has departed, someone you hold very dear, human, other than human, here, internationally. The title of the talk I uh, uh, gave today is from a poem from uh, a, a Palestinian poet named Rifat al -Arir. If I Must Die, You Must Live to Tell My Story. So this is our opportunity, I think, to tell that story. So for a minute and 58 seconds, um, let's, just, let's, just, let's just gather for that, for that purpose.
Thank you. I hope, I hope that was meaningful. So how are we gathered here? And how did um, someone like me end up in a position where we could gather around the work that someone um, like, like me would do? I, I hesitate very often to speak of my ancestry, speak of my background. And anyone who's been asked, where are you from, knows that feeling, um, especially with the follow-up question, which is, where, no, 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 like, where, where are you really from, right? <laughs> um, so I, I, I thought it was deserving, though, to think about a project like this, which is so much about ancestry and so much about inheritance and so much about disinheritance and the disruption of lineage that it would be only fair for me to speak a little bit about what I have inherited. So um, the next slide is uh, of my grandparents, uh, Iris and Joseph. This is uh, Trinidad, circa 1932. Um, and I've been channeling my grandmother a lot lately, uh, let me just tell you. And I don't know if <laughs> any of you have remember, have a, have a memory of that first artistic experience of seeing someone and thinking, maybe not, oh, that's art, but of later maybe retrospectively realizing that that creative act was embodied by that person. That person is my grandmother. And if I were to bring an object here today that would materialize that remembrance, it would be those little cones. If you know those decorators that have the end of the icing, and she had maybe a bag full of them. There was maybe about 20 of them, and they would jingle around when she was, make, make, you know, she would, she would decorate for all these occasions. And the steadiness and the craft in her hands is absolutely everything I would want to emulate to, uh, um, especially in, 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 this, in, the, in this project. And so in emulating that, um, I'm, I'm hoping that this question of where we come from and what our lineage is, is at the root of, of this project for everyone involved, everyone here gathered today. It's not just Newberg. It's not just those who have inherited this legacy of slavery, even though that's something that's obviously very much at the, at the core of it. So um, from uh, the age of two, um, I was sent to live with my grandmother. My mother was single parenting. You know, things were a little uh, difficult for her. I'm very grateful for that. And pretty much since that time, I bounced around um, no long, not much longer than, than three years in any single spot. I was in a, um, a, a boarding school for a while. Uh, I was known as um, Man Friday. You could tell that that was probably um, for uh, reasons of uh, somewhat um, um, uh, exclusion. Um, but um, later I found out that um, there's a very typical Akan from Ghana name, Kufi. Kufi, that's a name that comes up in a lot of slave registries. You see that. And Kufi apparently is the, is the, is the, is the Akan word for Friday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So I wear it now. I wear it now with, 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 with pride. Um, but then um, my uh, mother got a job working on a native reservation uh, up in uh, northern Quebec uh, among the Cree. And that was the first time in my life I was the white boy. So I, I come with multitudes, okay? Um, and this, I think, gives a certain, and it informs a lot of the practice that I'm uh, hoping to share with you today. So the next slide is inevitably the inheritance, I think, of once I settled in the Hudson Valley. This is where I went to school. This is where my daughter was born. This is as close to anything that I have called home in my life. And the idea that the inheritance of what this place just looks like might be embodied by something like this is something that I've only come now recently to question a little bit more. And if you're familiar with this genre of painting, 
of this 19th century representation of the Hudson Valley, what's otherwise known as the Hudson Valley School of um, Painting, um, you're probably familiar with the originator. So the next slide has a painting that maybe you've all seen. If you haven't seen it, you can go down to the Met it's hanging up in the American wing any day of the week, almost pretty much you could go and see it. And it's a painting by Thomas Cole. Thomas Cole is thought of as this sort of originator of what we call the Hudson River School. What is so original about the Hudson River School at the time? Thomas Cole posited the idea that landscape painting could be just that that it didn't need to reference antiquity. It had to have, didn't need to have ruins of Roman Greek architecture, that what he emphasized was this idea of the wilderness. That America, and for an Englishman, this is some, quite some chutzpah, okay? That America above all, its monument, its monumental character was its wilderness. Now, I don't know if you've, if you've seen this painting and if you looked at it enough, it's, it's not a, um, a, 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 a great projection of it, but you could see, I don't know if you could see over in this corner here of the mountain, there's a little sign, there's a little message. And this was pointed out to be by one of the uh, security guards at the Met. So let me just tell you, you never know where scholarship is coming from, okay? <laughs> And so the, if you, you cl click over to the next slide, that um, those, uh, if they look like letters, are exactly that. And um, if you would associate those as Hebrew letters, you would know that this is a nun, you know, going from uh, right to left, this is a nun and this is the letter chet. And nun and chet spell noach. And who's noach? The whole biblical narrative of the ark and the animals is almost like childlike fairy tale at this point. But what did Noah, what, pre what precipitated this whole story of the ark? Does everybody remember? No. What was it? What, 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 why, why, was he being, why was he building an ark? Yeah, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't climate change just yet, but it was, it was apocalyptic. God said, I'm done with y'all. We're going to start over. Ex and, and the flood was exactly the, apoca ap the root of the word apocalypse is, is beginning, new, the new beginning, right? And so in that same sense as... <laughs> Thomas Cole thought of America as a new beginning, this was the landscape that he was seeking to represent, this Eden, Eden-esque quality of it. And he says the most distinctive and the most impressive characteristic of the American scenery is its wilderness. He writes about this in an essay called, it's called On the American Picturesque. But then he goes on, and this is a particular quote I think is worth looking at. He says, very few generations have passed since this vast tract of the American continent rested in the shadow of primeval forests whose gloom was peopled by savage beasts and scarcely less savage men. Okay, so what is Thomas Cole getting at? The idea of this Eden the idea of this apocalyptic, this new beginning, this landscape, is predicated on the disappearance of its indigenous people. That's not the subtext that's always brought up with America's first art movement, and yet it is. It is at the root. It's about a disappearance. If you notice in this painting, where are the people, right? That's, that's, that, that disappearance, that absence, that is what got me started thinking. And the question was, I flip over to the next side, whether or not 
the idea of the peopling of these images. Now, so on the, on the left is the, the painting we were just looking at, the view from Mount Holyoke, otherwise known as the Oxbow. Even though later on, these paintings became very popularized in a series of prints, mostly um, circulated by a fellow named William Bartlett. Um, you see, there are people. You see some people? There's people. What, what, what kind of people? What would, I mean, it's, I know it's hard. What, how would you qualify these people? How would you... Um, hmm? Yeah, what are they doing? Uh, uh, okay. For, for them, this landscape is a landscape of leisure. And at the same time, we will skip over to the next slide, even though it's very formulaic, representation of that landscape starting maybe somewhere down in the Hudson Highlands, making your way up the Hudson River to Saratoga Springs, make a left at Albany, maybe you end up to Niagara Falls, okay? That, what we would call today the burgeoning industry of tourism, the idea of leisure, was a definition of the landscape that even though for some was a place of privilege, for others was a place of survival. This is the absence I started to become aware of. And if you go to the next slide, it'll explain why. What was happening in 1835, in 1836, in 1840 when these paintings were being made? It turns out, or when these prints were being made, it turns out that there was a whole social and a whole political landscape that was deep and as wide as the river that flows both ways. And from looking at these contemporaneous materials, which were also illustrated by artists, there were also folks who were down with the cause, so to speak, at the time. Let's skip to the next slide. The question was, was all this information about uh, pu published in those anti-slavery almanacs and abolitionist materials, right? That uh, very important information. This is the first census, the first uh, uh, national uh, U.S. census of 1790 lists uh, New York State as uh, having 21,000, almost 22,000 slaves. In 1820, that number is 10,000. And then in 1830, that number is 76. What happened? Did they just pack up and leave? No. When did slavery end in, in New York State? Quick, pop, pop quiz. So that th this is so. I, by, by the time I get to the end of this presentation, I hope that we will very much trouble that notion that slavery ended. Yes, in 1827, but the Gradual Abolition Act of 1799 mandated that yes, all children born after July 4th, 1827, would be free, and this what was once known as Newburgh's Colored Burial Ground, I think is a testament exactly to the idea that that date is in fact inaccurate. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But moving on to the next slide, the idea that these artists were down with the cause and were looking to illustrate things like a Fugitive Slave Act of 18, um, well, there were several Fugitive Slave Acts, the idea that could these images that were somehow destined for one audience, for one set of people, could I extract them, and we'll slip to the next line, and could I reinsert them, next slide, into these idyllic landscapes? And I chose this one in particular, Boston Springs, which is right next to Saratoga Springs, which is a very well-known city that the wealthy flocked to at the time for the medicinal character of its waters. Well, it also happens to be, next slide, 
It also happens to be the uh, birthplace of a fellow named Solomon Northup. If you know the story of Solomon Northup, a free black man who was exactly in the situation where the federal government legislated a legalized form of kidnapping where anyone based on the way they looked, like me, like you, could somehow be accused of committing the crime. What crime? The crime of stealing oneself from ownership, from someone else's ownership. You have to think about the legislative possibilities that were concocted around this reality. So could this image reference, uh, next line, the story of 12 years a slave? This is the whole purpose and the whole mechanism for me in terms of attempting to fill some of those voids. Could you look at that landscape again, uh, uh, flip to the next one, and think about some of those families? Think about the story of the narratives of folks like Frederick Douglass, of Solomon Northup. Uh, next one. And these are all local. It was Peekskill, Albany, and they're all taken, all these images are taken from and reproduced um, uh, by uh, creating a, 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 a printing plate. You can, you can take any digital image and from it create a, pr a printing plate. Don't ask me how it works. I just know there's a great company called Boxcar, Boxcar Press that can do it. And this process of reprinting, printing on the print, um, of re, in a way, reissuing the latest edition, more updated version of the print is what this, uh, these, I uh, call them ahistorical landscapes, um, were uh, designed uh, to do. So uh, flip one more, there's a couple more. Uh, Lake George, some of you are familiar. But the, 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 the question remains, did slavery end in 1827, okay, I just want to make sure that we reference that back when we make our way a little uh, further in the historical record to where we get to uh, the years 1832 and 1867, which are the years in which the, what was known as the Newburgh Color Burial Ground was in use. Okay, next slide. This reference to the fugitive, uh, sorry, the uh, um, gradual abolition, the painfully, slowly, gradually, uh, a, a, a gradual abolition of, of slavery in, the, uh, in, in New York State um, legislated what? It legislated that if you happen to have the good fortune of being born after July 4th, 1799, you were considered free, but because there's always a but, nevertheless, to be born free, nevertheless, is the word that's used. If you were male, you were expected to, to serve 28 years as an indentured servant, and tw if, you were, if, you, if you were female, 25. So, again, when did slavery end? In 1827? Not quite. Not quite. Okay, uh, next slide. I've been thinking about the landscape in which uh, this history is recorded. There are many of these riverfront properties that once belonged to names like the Livingstons, that might, may, may, may be familiar, that are still uh, present today, that actually have this history recorded in them. Next slide. Um, this is uh, Catherine Livingston. Uh, who married a radical abolitionist minister named Freeborn Garretson. And Freeborn Garretson was gifted uh, the property, uh, which is now uh, um, a portion of which is uh, a historic site that's called Wilderstein in Rhinebeck today. And I was very curious about whether they were aware of this history of having a radical abolitionist Methodist minister owning that property at the time, they were not. <laughs> um, and I was interested in whether this history could be 
made known. And um, through some of the research done by Susan Stesson Cohn and Ashley Biagini, uh, some of you uh, may be familiar with a, a, a book called In Defiance, which is a collection of runaway ads, about, 100 and, about a, almost 100 years uh, worth of them, uh, 100 years worth of, of these ads that were put in the paper by fellows like, oh, wouldn't you know, Henry B. Livingston, her brother, looking for a fellow named Solomon, a, a black, quote unquote, uh, boy, who decided that the only kind of emancipation in New York State was going to be self-emancipation. And um, I just was curious, what was Thanksgiving dinner like at the Livingstons? Um, did Solomon, by any chance, find refuge among the Garretsons in Rhinebeck at that property. This is the speculative nature of the work that I begin, I think, where historians end, the place where historians are not really willing to go. There's a legendary code called the Underground Railroad Code that's believed that enslaved women would stitch patterns in quilts to hang out, to message about the passings and the goings of the railroad conductors through one town or another. When I say legendary, I, 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 I lean on that because I'm less interested in the veracity of the story and more in the necessity of telling the story. And so each of those codes, we'll flip to the next slide, is a, there's a book, oh sorry, go back one. There's a book um, that, where Ozella's Underground Quilt Code, which has been sort of debunked, and people who say, well, no, those quilt codes actually, quilt patterns date from after the Civil War, so they couldn't have been. Necessity, not veracity. We talk a lot about George Washington and some tree. Like, I don't know if that happened, <laughs> right? Is it veracity? We don't know. But somehow the necessity of that story um, makes itself known. <laughs> So, so um, in thinking about Solomon and in thinking about whether or not the landscape in which this Queen Anne um, house is located um, could record the passage of this speculative trail of the Underground Railroad, spur of the Underground Railroad, is what um, the project um, centered itself around. Okay, next slide. I have a lot to try and go through. The, the pattern sort of aged with, with the bricks, and then even when they were removed, had something of this burial kind of quality. And I really think that I've sort of held on to that um, into uh, several other projects, including this one. Okay, next slide. Everybody knows that before it was New York, it was New Amsterdam. And who were the first Africans to be brought to New Amsterdam? They were, they were Afro-Dutch people. They spoke, they didn't speak English. They spoke whatever language they uh, were born speaking, and then they also spoke, spoke Dutch. Um, one of the first uh, historical records, um, next slide, in the Dutch colonial records, which are only now coming to surface because there are very few people who are able to read that 17th century Dutch, let alone transcribe all this beautiful penmanship, the very first murder case in New York or New Amsterdam was the case of nine black men, nine Africans. Manuel de Gerrit de Roos, Simon Conge, Jan de Fort Orange, Polo de Angola. You can see their origins literally in their names. Jacia de Angola, Anthony Portuguese, Klein Antonio, Manuel de Groot and Manuel Minuit, if you know Minuit, that name is also very um, well recorded in the supposed genesis of uh, Manhattan. But what does the case tell us? What was it about? The nine enslaved men were accused of murdering another enslaved man. And so the Dutch colonial company had a difficult case to solve because they could not determine who was the guilty party. Why? because all nine locked arms and they said, you know what? We're guilty one as the other. 
So if you're going to kill all of us, you're going to kill one of us, you're going to have to kill all of us. That's basically what they said. Which is the very, very, at the very genesis of this colonial history, a testament to the solidarity and the knowledge that these men had already of what they were capable of. So what did the Dutch colonial council, were they going to execute almost one-tenth of their workforce? The Dutch, they're very practical. So they said, we'll let God decide. So they had them draw straws. And the one who drew the short straw was Manuel de Gerrit de Roos, whose name coincidentally translates as the giant. That's also been debunked. Does it really mean the giant or not? Next slide. So on that day, in 1641, cold day in January, Manuel de Gerrit de Roos goes up onto the gallows, okay? I'm paraphrasing, but it's almost word for word. Stands up on the ladder. The executioner puts three goede stolpe, two good ropes. I can speak 15th century Dutch because no one else was going to correct me on it. Two good ropes around his neck. And when the executioner kicked the ladder from under him, well, wouldn't you know, both ropes broke and he fell to his knees and the crowd cried mercy. Clearly this was divine intervention. And so God had, cho God had indeed chosen. I, I'm not, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, I don't know how this is a movie. If somebody has Jordan Peele's number, please let me know. Um, um, so, uh, next slide. So as always with slavery, there was a catch. Manuel de Gerrit de Roos and the eight other men were pardoned and they were offered their freedom. However, they were offered a conditional form of freedom in which they would pay 30 schepel, like, a, like a 30, 30 uh, uh, bushels of corn, wheat, maize, some sort of agriculture, uh, agricultural product. Um, ein wet varken, it's not, oh yeah, ein wet varken, one fat hog for their freedom, and kinderen, their children. They were free, their wives were free, but not the children. The children would remain in service of the Dutch, born or yet to be born. And this reality is um, something that I felt needed to be um, spoken. And um, if you sp skip to the next line, um, and also illustrated. So I thought about, well, who was the hot artist of the 1640s? Peter Paul Rubens was all de rigueur. He was also one of the few artists that had African models. This was Amsterdam in the 17th century, super cosmopolitan. So could I substitute in the same way the prints were a form of, 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 of substitution or updating or correction, these images of, of, of these drawings of Peter Paul Rubens with some of his own, own work to reference these, these nine, these first uh, nine free black Afro-Dutch citizens of New Amsterdam. Next slide. That's what it turned out to be. So um, um, they're, they're printed, they're digitally printed on, on, on fabric. There's a, 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 a map of, of that map of New Amsterdam uh, laid out in, in bricks. And um, this, the gallery in uh, lower Manhattan was maybe about two or three blocks where that execution actually happened. So la last week I s tried to spend some time hopefully convincing folks that this project is really about making history. And I'm not exaggerating. I know this seems like there's a lot of sort of skeptical looking faces. <laughs> this, is, this is what I mean by making history in the sense of giving names to the unnamed, the yet to be named, okay? Uh, next slide. I just want a short, a short clip of, I managed to get a D native Dutch speaker to read the 17th century Dutch word for word. She was actually able to, 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 to read it. It didn't seem that, that foreign. But just so you know that I'm not making stuff up, word for word, this is the Dutch Colonial Council Minutes.
gehouden wezen voor de genotenvrijheid. Ieder manspersoon voor zijn hoofd jaarlijks tot het einde zijn levens toe aan de West-Indische Compagnie of de harige machtigen al hiet te betalen 30 schepel mais, zij koren, koorn, erten of bonen en de een vet varken, geëstimeerd op 20 gulden. 30 schepel en de een vet varken. Met expresse conditieën dat haar kinderen zo jegenwoordig geboren of te nog geboren zullen worden, gehouden en de verplicht blijven de West-Indische Compagnie te diensten te zijn als lijfeigenen. Kinderen en de een vet varken. Mitschaders, kinderen, dat de boven kinderen, geschreven kinderen, nee, boven geschreven kinderen, manspersonen de West-Indische Compagnie hier kinderen, te landen zullen gehouden. Kinderen. Actum 25 februari 1644 in het Fort Amsterdam in Nieuw-Nederland. Okay, so similarly on the Dutch vein of things in Rockland County, there is a barn that was dated 1790 that the county spent $1.6 million restoring and it triggered a legislative uh, a percent for the art program that they have there. So there was a chunk of change to make some art commemorating this legacy, this Dutch legacy. Well, now that I had this interesting story of Manuel Gerrit de Roos, I was very interested in learning that the barn was called the Blauvelt barn. And the Blauvelt family, it turns out, like many of the Dutch families, were not only the biggest enslavers, the oldest enslavers, but the most resistant to the abolition of slavery right here, especially in the Hudson Valley. And Johannes, this is a Johannes Blauvelt, one of those runaway ads against these, these sort of primary source materials that described um, um, uh, a, young, a young man, uh, uh, um, Adonia, or he goes by Don, um, who speaks uh, Dutch. He says he speaks low Dutch and a little English. Okay, these are primary documents. This, I'm not, I'm not making, making this stuff up. So it occurred to me that they were probably in this Blauvelt 19, 1790 Blauvelt Dutch barn, quite a few black Blauvelts. Who worked in this barn? Who tended to the animals in this barn? Maybe who even built this barn? So the question, um, next slide, uh, I sort of focused on was thinking about what type of Dutch, since he was a spoke, spoke low Dutch, what kind of creolized version of this Dutch did they speak at that time? And it turns out that the Dutch being uh, strict Calvinists, they were very interested in their Christianization, taught their enslaved people to, to read and also to speak that, um, that Dutch. And um, these primers that were published at the time in the Caribbean, in St. Croix, in St. Thomas, some of those Dutch colonies uh, are a testament to that. And um, in reading some of the sections, there were these proverbs that were used as some of this teaching material. And I swear to you, it's, they were sometimes word for word things that my grandmother would say. Um, you skip to the next slide. A pumpkin cannot make a gourd. What does that mean? Does anybody have an interpretation? No? I mean, my mother would, my, 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 my grandmother would say, goat don't make sheep. Like, the apple does not fall far from the tree. Like, don't try and be something you're not. 
right? That, 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 is, that kind of folk talk is something that is also an inheritance and something that is sort of fascinated in. You know, um, if you go into the snake hole, you won't get, you know, snake news. What, what, is that, what could that possibly mean? You know, I mean, this is a word for word. This was in the book, okay? I'm quoting directly. You know, you, go, you, look, you look, for, look, for, look for bad news, you, you're going to find it. You know, I mean, it's, 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 it's as basic as that. So I propose this series of sculptures. Um, next slide. Um, that are uh, cut out of steel. Um, your mouth will buy you a horse for you to ride. What could that possibly mean? Stefan. A horse could buy you, uh, your, your mouth, your tongue could buy you a horse for you to ride. What does that mean? <laughs> All right? What? I mean, it's, it's open for interpretation, right? I mean, I would imagine that somebody like Adonis, who was on the run, right? Uh, who, who probably had to pass for a free man, probably needed to talk like a free man, right? You had to, you had to be slick, you had to, you had to dress, you had to embody the freedom before you even seized it for yourself. Um, that's, that's my interpretation of it. So look, um, and uh, I just delivered the, the sculptures. They'll be um, installed hopefully uh, in the spring of, of, of next year in a Cropsey Community Farm in, in Rockland County. Let's, let's just keep going. Um, I was approached after that project by Dan Goswick. He's chief uh, uh, um, uh, of, the, of the firehouse in Piermont, New York. It's just right across the, uh, I still call it the Tappan Zee Bridge on, uh, on, on this side. Um, not the most woke guy, I'll just tell you right away. But he said to me, we want to make a sculpture and we want to we wanna honor our first line of duty death. It's a thing, military, L-O-D-D. -D. I said, okay. His first line of duty death, I don't know if you can see in this picture, from 1850, is this fellow right here. Next slide. He's the only one who doesn't have a uniform. His name is Thomas Pomplin. Thomas Pomplin, Pomplin ran in 1854 uh, to a call for a barrel factory that was on fire um, and uh, later succumbed to his um, injuries uh, af after, after that, um, that call. Um, so I took the image of, of, of Thomas. Next slide. I sort of, you know, stylized it, shopped it a little bit. Next slide. Um, and, and then the sort of the same result, this water jet cut steel um, sculpture, which finally kind of is a sort of honorific next slide where he may not have actually worn the uniform, but has been awarded it um, po po posthumously. If you click, if you just hover here, you can see there's the mayor. He's so awkward. Um, and the, the, un the unveiling, but there was something kind of unexpected happen where you can, you can see the other, Firefighters threw it. It's sort of like a strange kind of mirroring effect. The whole idea is the make, making making history whole, and that's um, what the, that project was about. Next slide. I did a project for um, Jackie's not here. I uh, uh, was invited at uh, Ramapo College where this fantastic, beautiful arch um, was brought over from the mansion of Theodore Havemeyer. It's called the Havemeyer Arch. It's very, very referenced on the, on the campus as um, the legacy of one of America's greatest sugar refining fortunes in 1888. Um, he built the, this, this mansion, which was on uh, Madison Avenue. Why were these sugar barons so a able to, to create, to amass this wealth? Well, after 1865, it turns out that slavery could be exported elsewhere. Does anybody know where, um, uh, when, when slavery ended in Cuba? <laughs> 1888. And where did the Havemeyers source 100% of their sugar? Cuba. 
So um, the idea of the stolen sugar uh, makes the sweetest books was to draw the outline of the Havermeyer Arch. The president of the college was there. I pitched the idea, you know, maybe we could sell some of these stones as a fundraiser for students of Caribbean descent to come to the college as a scholarship. Um, she said, yeah, great idea. I haven't heard from her yet, but that's all good. <laughs> Next slide. Um, this is probably the project that resembles most what's happening here. I uh, called it a burial for white supremacy. Mostly aspirational. I don't know if it's worked just yet. Um, but if you skip, skip the next slide, there's a short video. It'll just explain what, what, um, what, that, what that was like. So participants were invited to consider some of the questions that I posed and to cast a stone if they felt that they were answering in the affirmative. We're gathered here today, but we do not mourn. We're gathered here today because we are inheritors of another legacy that of white supremacy. We'll each be casting a stone into the casket until the burden of what we have cast into it exceeds its ability to stay above ground. If you've smoked weed and you were never worried about getting arrested, cast a stone. If you've ever been stopped for a traffic violation and you never feared for your safety, please come cast a stone. If you've been able to go to bed at night and never worry about waking up in the morning dead, shot by bullets that were not destined for you, Please cast a stone. Okay, um, we're getting closer. Next slide, just to finish up. There's a couple of monuments that have informed a lot of what I've been doing. I've never been to this one in particular. It's a monument to um, what is, I mean, con considered as, you know, the origin of what we call uh, historical materialism. What's historical materialism? If you heard of the idea that the winners write the history books, this is kind of the guy who suggested that idea, Walter Benjamin. And not only that, but that that idea was false. And if you walk through this um, strange uh, tunnel, you come down to this oceanic opening, and on the glass there's uh, some words that are etched um, in the location where he's thought to, I mean, I, I don't know how much it's been verified, but uh, his, his, his last um, 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 hours, minutes were spent there when he realized that um, the train that was going to come and, and uh, take him uh, as a, a German Jewish uh, philosopher um, out of France and into Spain um, to freedom um, wasn't going to arrive. Uh, he took uh, that um, um, uh, fatal dose of, of, of morphine. But those last words, um, next slide, I mean they're translated as the most arduous it is more arduous to honor the memory of the anonymous than that of the renowned. And the construction of history is consecrated to the memory of the nameless. Now that's been maybe updated to the question of maybe to, those to be named or those once named. That the idea that history is not made actually fundamentally by those the winners, those of those renowned, that it's the it's the nameless that who who are going to leave the the, the, the testament um, for us. Um, next slide. 
And then uh, there's another monument um, that I've been thinking about to W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, it's in, out in Great Barrington, his boyhood home. Um, if you've been there, uh, just hit the next slide. Um, just hit that, um, the, the, the play button. Uh, I went there with uh, my friend Harry. There's nothing there. It's actually, it's, it's quite haunting and, and amazing. The hushed kind of presence and, and absence of, of, of that place to such a giant of, uh, of, of black scholarship. And I'm just going to end with um, something that I read um, last week that's been um, resonating with me as um, Du Bois, I see him as a, as a precursor to that idea of, of, of you know, historical um, materialism. Um, in uh, a chapter of um, his sort of magnum opus, uh, The Souls of, of Black Folk. It's uh, chapter 11, and it's called The Passing of the Firstborn. And it's exactly that. It's his description of his loss of his 18-month-old baby. And he describes it like this. He says, I saw the shadow of the veil as it passed over my baby. I saw his breath beat quicker and quicker, pause, and then his little soul leapt like a star that travels in the night and left a world of darkness in its train. And I think it's important to point out that what Du Bois means by the veil in this case is not the veil of, of, of death, um, uh, the way the images here are, are, are veiled in the sense of um, almost like a, a, a attending a, a, a wake. Um, but what for Du Bois was the, the veil was what he would describe as the critical consciousness of being black, that his son was spared the indignities of living in a world that he describes um, like this. Holding in that little head, ah, bitterly, clinging with that tiny dimpled hand, seeing with those bright wondering eyes that peer into my soul a land whose freedom is to us a mockery and whose liberty is a lie. Du Bois births, I think, this idea of, of, of criticality, of the idea of being able to hold multiple truths at once. And if you've uh, ever lost someone, especially someone who's um, gone through a great deal of pain, you might empathize with what Du Bois is, is talking about, the possibility that there's an interchangeable sense of the feeling of grief and, and that of uh, relief. Um, when my sister died, my mother dragged me into the room and kicked everybody out and started rubbing down my sister with these strange concoction of oils and, and, and we shrouded her in, 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 in these clean um, bed sheets and she, without a word she didn't explain anything that was what was going on. And I felt like I was um, witness to probably the most um, uh, both painful and, and, and meaningful uh, moments in, uh, in my life. So this is where we're at. Next slide. Um, the presence of um, folks like uh, Gabrielle and and, and Cal Conway and um, those who've uh, gathered to um, recognize the former, uh, what was once known as the uh, Newburgh Colored Burial Ground as, as a hallowed ground is um, something that I feel um, encouraged and proud to be uh, part of um, every uh, time that we, we, we do gather. And I do mean it when I say that we're making history. Um, next slide. We're making history in the sense that the record of those who would have been buried in the Alms House Cemetery, the, the segregated 
almshouse cemetery. They had, the city of Newburgh had a cemetery for strangers, a cemetery for white folk, and a cemetery for what were called colored people. And that was what was at the corner of what was known as Western Avenue. And even though Robinson Avenue wasn't there at the time, you can see the city surveyor, well, if you zoom in there, it clearly says colored, colored burial ground. Um, next slide. But what I mean by we're making history is the evidence of the Alms House records that have been uh, brought by Michael Vandervoort, who's working on Spoma, the sacred place of my ancestors over in Montgomery. Um, these, are, these are testaments to the folks um, who may have been buried in the cemetery, may have been. This is my speculative um, approach. People like um, Phoebe Colden says she was born in Africa, was once enslaved to Caldwallader Colden, former mayor of New York City, eventually president of the Manumission Society in New York City, and uh, where uh, uh, it sounds like she uh, purchased uh, her freedom. Uh, her, 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 her 11 children, her oldest was 80 years of age. I mean, this is history. Um, that's, that's not been part, obviously, of um, the record. Uh, but is she buried here among us? It's, it's, it's entirely possible. Uh, the next slide. Uh, William King, um, born in Newburgh, aged nine years, uh, was chargeable to Newburgh, and his, um, his examination, it says that he's been in jail, a nine-year-old in jail, in the summer as a vagrant. Now it's important to note when I was saying when did slavery end in New York State, there are scholars like uh, um, David Gelman in a book called Emancipating New York who argues that the gradual, very slow, very painful, gradual abolition of slavery in New York State was actually a scheme that was meant to reimburse in a way to reparations, if you like, for not the enslaved, but the enslavers, in that any child or young adult who was not gainfully employed was, became a ward of the state. And that's why if you see any manumission records from the, uh, the, the, the period, they all have to, had to be signed by the overseers of the poor to effectually say that this person is, is, is no longer dependent on public services. Why? Because if you were like this young boy, William King, and you were able to labor, the city, usually the almshouse, would hire out those individuals, very often back to the same enslavers that they may have worked for originally, and they split the profits. So essentially, when we talk, when we look at the South, and you look at Reconstruction, and you look at convict leasing program, it's very possible, not me saying it, um, but folks like David Gelman, that it's very possible that New York, New, New York State had invented a scheme, a sort of leasing program way before Reconstruction in, in, uh, in, in, in places like in Texas and Sugar Land, which is also um, um, a, a case right now, which is looking at um, the descendants of um, formerly, formerly incarcerated, formerly um, one way uh, enslaved by another name. Okay, um, last couple of slides before we finish up. Oh, this is a correction to the record. Diana Payne. Diana Payne is listed in the historical narrative. Um, the historian who presented last week, Dr. McPherson, who's listed as being buried, one of only six people buried, as we, uh, uh, according to the uh, city of Newburgh's issuance of death permits in the Newburgh Color Burial Ground. Well, guess what? Diana Payne is resting peacefully in New Windsor at Greenwood. Not, there's no pauper. She has a beautiful, beautiful headstone uh, right there, which I made a, a, little, a little rubbing. Okay, next slide. We'll talk about um, Myra B. Young, Young Armstead, who um, will hopefully come and present uh, 
her historical account of uh, James F. Brown. If you don't know James Brown, this is the James Brown you really need to know about, uh, who lived in, uh, in what was then Fishkill Landing, or today Beacon in the Verplank household, who was a gardener for 30 years, mingled with folks like Andrew Jackson Downing and Henry Winthrop Sargent. He was a master gardener, an African-American whose life was extraordinary, and this is what Myra Armstead, um, the historian, uh, found out. Her, his life was extraordinary because, well, first of all, he kept a diary for 30 years, wrote down everything, the day, the temperature, the irises were blooming, everything. And um, to her uh, um, disappointment, uh, found the diary otherwise utterly boring and uninteresting, no information about his life or his thinking. It was nothing, there's not a Victorian type of, of, of diary. But came to, she came to the conclusion that what was so extraordinary about his life was that it was so ordinary, is that he lived a fully enfranchised life as a citizen, a property owner, he could vote. He, as an African-American, was as American as, as he was African, and that's what was so, so exceptional for, for uh, um, someone like him at the time, whose life also coincides with the period we we're talking about with the cemetery. Okay, and la next slide, just to finish up. So, what's being asked of you, uh, attendees, um, once we have this evidentiary phase of the exhibition up, um, these burial shrouds that I was referencing are meant to house um, what architects refer to, um, archaeologists refer to as conjuring bundles. So very often the last known remains of, or maybe the favorite um, uh, objects of, of the deceased. And so I'm inviting uh, anyone and everyone to commemorate, in a way, these lives by bringing something significant of your own, of your own ancestry, perhaps, that um, we could record here. Uh, if you, uh, uh, we'll, we'll just hold it carefully. Um, we'll, 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 we'll return it if you feel um, the need to have it back, obviously. Um, but the purpose of it being that um, your legacy, this history that's um, being made can be a testament to the history that these ancestors who've repeatedly come out of the ground to tell us that they're here, once in 1872 and then again in 1908 and then again in 2008, that um, this might be a, a testament to their, to their lives and their deaths here in the, in the city of Newburgh. So in that little crib that's over there, underneath the burial shrouds, there are these, um, I told you I've been ch channeling my grandmother as best as I can. I don't know, she'd be, she, she, she might not be too impressed. But these, these, these are meant to be the conjuring bundles uh, for you to take with you and to fill and to, to, to bring back for the burial shrouds. Um, so with that, I thank you uh, for your attention. I'll open it up if there are any comments, any questions, um, any relevant connections to our um, present. Um, I, I did mention in the beginning that the, the, the title I did want to give to the talk today was a reference to the poem um, by Rifat Alarir that uh, if I die, if I must die, uh, we, we the living, what, what responsibility do we have towards towards the dead. But the dead only ask one thing of us, and that's to remember them. That's all they ask. So can we do it? That's it. Thank you. But just for in case people weren't here last week when you talked about what is in the gallery, yes. can you just talk about what's on display now and how that will change over time? So what's on display are, to my count, the 108 burials that contain the folks who were discovered during the archaeological, pro the archaeological dig at um, what was known as the Newburgh Colored Burial Ground. They're each 
displayed next to the person they were buried. This is not the order that they're in the archaeological record. It's not the order that they'll probably be reburied in. And so the opportunity in this gallery, which I think is, you know, uh, unique in that it probably couldn't be done anywhere else, is having them buried as they were, next to who they were buried. We don't know exactly uh, what the relationship may have been, but as far as the physio physical relationship, it is contiguous. This is, this is how they were buried. It's unlikely that they will be reinterred in the same way. So this is one opportunity to do that um, b before um, um, their, 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 final, their final resting place. They're placed a little high. Um, I've been told um, that height uh, references, this is exactly 72 inches, six feet. So we're six feet under them. And each of the tacks that were used are, are copper, reference the one artifact that's found in every single burial, which is coffin nails. And that's how the archaeologist, archaeologist has dated the burial ground to have been in use probably around as early as 1832 because those coffin nails were only manufactured industrially as of 1831, 1832. So prior to that, if you had coffin nails, you probably paid quite dearly for them. So the idea that these bodies were very well taken care of. Um, the textile is the other second most prevalent artifact in the uh, burials is a testament to the fact that these bodies were shrouded, they were cared for. And the question of what would you bury your dead in, in 1832, an almshouse, a pauper, what would you bury your dead in is a question that I've been sort of thinking about and what is referenced in um, the fabric that I've been finding in, in and around um, the um, secondhand stores in Newburgh. Um, was there um, the, the, the poetry um, in the front of David Mills um, references um, that um, uh, process um, that occurred in uh, Manhattan when that burial ground was discovered uh, in the 90s um, and David Mills uh, in a similar process of uh, um, 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 absorbing a lot of the information from um, the archaeological record has written some, some um, um, excavating in that in that same way some 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 poetry that I think really um, relates to um, the kind of excavation that this 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 project is is part of as, as well the copper wire is 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 meant to be this this conductive it's one of those enduring metals it just hangs around it's always in these burials the things that we think of as dead are never quite dead they just keep resurfacing um, so that continuity is something that I'm, I'm, I'm looking to, to work with as I start to look at each one of the burials, identifying which who's male, who's female, the children, the elders, who's an elder. You know, Phoebe, 104 years old, it's incredible. I mean, by age 50 in 1832, if you're an African-American, you were probably already an elder. Um, those are sort of questions that, that will continue to be um, part of the, of, of the process, both in um, this uh, gallery, in this physical form, but also I mentioned um, Gwen uh, Laster, uh, some of the um, musicians who might be involved, and, um, and, and also some of the uh, poets, uh, Kate, Kate Himes, uh, Ulster County Poet Laureate, um, who uh, is also, uh, she's the one who actually pointed out that Diana Payne is no pauper. She was, she was buried in uh, a very, a very um, beautiful, beautiful um, place. So this kind of crowdsourcing that's happening, all this information is what I mean by the history and the making. Like the people are, 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 are bringing uh, information that um, uh, up till now has, has, has not been part of the historical record. So uh, if you want to get involved, just let me know. FTGU 2024. Just follow it on Instagram. Yes. Well, that was a very moving presentation. Oh, thank you. Congratulations on all this work. It's incredible. Um, I'm curious, can you talk about the imagery um, 
not from the bottom. I'm tr- I, I apologize, I'm far back, I forget. Close. No. Are those photographs on the bottom? And so, drawing you did on the top? So the veil is meant to uh, avoid, I think what um, uh, Sadia Hartman, who's a critical historian talks about the kind of violence that the archive has done to black bodies and the um, um, un- unnecessary exhibition of that, that, that type of violence. So the veil is meant to, to allow you to decide if you wanted to access that information that you could do so. But the, each of the images, they're not mine, they're from the archeological report. So they're each burial as they were photographed. And there's a schema that um, sort of uh, maybe draws out what's not evident in in the photograph. Uh, Very often it's um, where the school foundation um, was constructed and and interrupted uh, many many of the burials. So everything in that corner over there, um, those last two rows, are um, those are the um, the folks who who remain, who were not um, disinterred, and um, who were not removed. And I'm paraphrasing, but um, be, because to remove them would would structurally compromise the the building that that's built on top of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then the, the top part is the drawing. The top part is the is the yeah. It's City. it's um, that's the that's the archaeologist. Yeah, so it's the, 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 they call it the plan view. So it just situates the, the scale and um, very often the orientation. Every single body follows a very uh, Christian burial tradition, uh, east-west orientation, the feet facing east, head facing west, except for right above Yunin, actually, is, um, that's the exception to the rule. It's the only burial that's 180 degrees the other way around. And then again, a Christian um, burial tradition that has often been uh, uh, used to, to uh, reference a, a minister or someone of um, clerical kind of uh, um, um, uh, identity. So uh, again, speculation. Right.